The Woman in Black, from the novel by Susan Hill, adapted for radio by John Strickland. Episode two, A Causeway and a Pony Trap. You may leave me here, Mr. Kipps. My office is just above the shop, thank you. You are most welcome, Mr. Jerome. Although, are you quite sure you're recovered? You didn't seem at all well back there at the churchyard. I've already apologised, Mr. Kipps. I assure you it was nothing. Well, I think the walk back must have done you good. You've a good deal more colour now than you had a few moments ago. As I said, sir, a passing faintness, nothing more. Yes, quite. Now then, what time shall I return? Return, Mr. Kipps? Yes. Are you not to take me over to Ilmarsh House later? I, uh... I think there must be some mistake, sir. I shall not go across there. You can cross any time after one o'clock. Uh, Keckwick will come for you. He's always been the go-between to that place. I take it you have a key? Yes. Brought one up from London with me. Good. He'll call for you at the Gifford Arms, sir, within the hour. All right. I do want to get there today if I can. It'll enable me to make a start at least, though I shall probably have to go across again tomorrow. I really have no idea what I'll find until I get there. It would no doubt make much more sense to sleep there overnight. Oh, I think you'd find it much more comfortable to continue staying where you are, sir. Well, the food is certainly first-rate. Yes, you may be right. I'm sure I am, sir. So long as it causes no one any inconvenience. You'll find Kickwick perfectly obliging, sir. I'm sure I will. Though not very communicative. Now, if you will forgive me... Mr Jerome scuttled away again like a rabbit to its hole. I half moved to call him back for I was becoming curiously irritated by his evasiveness and thought of trying to get out of him exactly what was meant by it. It all seemed to hint of silly local tales which had grown out of all proportion. Doubtless, in such a place as this, with its eerie marshes, sudden fogs, moaning winds and lonely houses, any poor old woman like Mrs Drablow might be looked at askance. Once upon a time, after all. She would have been branded as a witch. For my own part, as I crossed the square back to the hotel to wait for Mr Keckwick, I resolved to enjoy the whole business, to relish my newfound responsibility. I would endeavour to be amused by it all, as adding no more than a touch of spice and local colour to my expedition. Oh, come on, come on, what's keeping you, man? Yeah, come in. Oh, it's only me, Mr Kipps. I'm sorry to interrupt, but will you be here for your lunch? Only we it be in market day, it'd help if I had some idea at numbers. Well, it's beginning to look as if I shall be stuck here all day. I was expecting a Mr Kekwick to take me across to Eelmarsh House, but I dare say Mr Jerome forgot to tell him. Kekwick? Why, he's outside, sir. I wondered who he were waiting on. He's outside? Ah, he's always been there ten minutes or more. Well, why didn't he come in and announce himself? I've been sitting here for the last half an hour. Am I to tell him you're on your way, sir? No, no, it's all right. I'm quite ready. I'll find him myself. As you like, sir. Oh, does that mean you'll be back for your supper, then? Uh, yes, though I'm not sure what time. That rather depends on what I find out there. At Eel Marsh, sir? Well, yes, that's where I'm headed. Aye. Well, no doubt you'll be back before dark, Mr Kipps. Keckwick will see to that, I'm sure. Will he? Good. Now, look, I really must go before our Mr Keckwick takes it into his head to leave us as anonymously as he arrived. Now, you take care out there, Mr Kipps. Mr Keckwick? Mr Kipps? Oh, you're Mr Keckwick. I'm sorry, I was expecting a car for some reason. But this is delightful. Uh, do I climb up? Without you want to walk behind. I beg your pardon? Oh, right, yes. If I can just use this to pull myself. Uh, there. Get out there! Oh! Oh, I say, this is uh, quite a novel experience for me, Mr Keckwick. It's a while since I've ridden in a pony and trap. I'm, um... I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Mr Keckwick, back at the hotel. I didn't realise you'd arrived until Mrs... Uh, the landlord's wife told me. You see, I'm afraid you were sitting outside and I was sitting inside, both of us twiddling our thumbs for a good ten minutes. Still, no matter. It's a beautiful morning. The time of year. Should be good for business today. Ah. Ah, it's the church again. This is the second time I've seen it today. I was at the funeral this morning. Mrs. Drablows. 
It all seemed to pass off fairly uh, smoothly, solemnly. Not that there was actually a very large turnout, just one mourner, apart from Mr. Jerome and myself, of course. In fact, you might be able to help me, Mr. Catwick. You see, I wasn't able to speak to the young lady at the time, or indeed even to find out her name. But perhaps you might know her. She was fairly tall, slim, dressed entirely in black and of the most gaunt appearance. In fact, I would have to say that she looked quite desperately unwell. I can't imagine there is another in the town who looks like her. Would you have any idea who she might be? Go on, get out of there! Keckwick was marginally more taciturn than Mr. Jerome, if that were possible. He was certainly not to be drawn on the identity of the mysterious woman in black, and I very quickly abandoned all attempts to engage him in conversation. Instead, I concentrated on my immediate surroundings as we drove on out into open country, leaving Crithin Gifford and all its market day bustle far behind. And what country it was. All around and above and way beyond, there seemed to be sky, sky, and only a thin strip of land. As we drove briskly across the absolutely flat land, we passed no farm or cottage, scarcely even a tree. All was emptiness. The hedgerows petered out. The ploughed soil gave way to rough grass, dikes, and ditches filled with water. And then we were approaching the marshes themselves. We seemed to be journeying towards the very edge of the world. And this must be the Nine Lives Causeway we're on now, Mr. Kekwick, eh? Uh, presumably, when the tide comes in, it's quite submerged. Easy, girl. Easy. Not a place to come without a good knowledge of the local tides, eh? But quite astoundingly beautiful nonetheless. I never imagined such a place as... Good gracious! That, I take it, is Eelmarsh House. Up ahead. Aye, that's her. It stood like some lighthouse or beacon, rising as if out of the water itself. A tall, gaunt house of grey stone, with a slate roof that gleamed like steel in the pale light. It was quite simply the most astonishingly situated house I had ever seen, or could ever conceivably have imagined. Isolated, uncompromising. Handsome, Mr. Keckwick. That's a quite astonishingly handsome house. I've never seen the like. Oh, there. Oh! Thank you, Mr. Keckwick. Well, I, uh, I simply don't know what to say. I am truly speechless. I've certainly never been anywhere quite like this. It's a rather strange sensation. Lonely as could be, but also exciting. Disturbing, I was going to say. Although, to be sure, there's nothing here to frighten. There's not much here at all, Mr. Kipps. Indeed. Wind, marsh birds, reeds and still water. It's a rare and beautiful spot. I can hardly wait to explore the place. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I was quite transported for a moment. Um, how long will that causeway remain passable? Till about five. Oh, is that all? Well, listen... It'll be quite ridiculous for you to be driving to and fro twice a day like this. I think the best thing will be for me to bring my bags, and some food and drink, of course, and stay over a couple of nights. Stop here? Oh, yes. It seems the most sensible course of action. So for now, I'd simply like you to collect me before the tide comes in this afternoon, and then tomorrow morning bring me back out here as early as possible. If you are agreeable, that is. It's not for me to be agreeable. Or you perhaps prefer to wait here for me now? though I shall be a couple of hours. You know what suits you best. Get you. Where are they? And a very good day to you too, Mr. Keckwick. Extraordinary people. I think you may have had the right idea, Mrs. Drablow. Staying out here as far away from them all as possible. Now then, let's have a look at exactly what Eel Marsh comprises. I walked away from the house, across an area of scrub and field, towards the ruins of some old church or chapel, which I'd noticed earlier as we approached the island. To the west, the sun was already beginning to shoot arrows of fire and blood-red streaks across the water. 
To the east, sea and sky had darkened slightly to a uniform leaden grey. Behind the crumbling arches of the derelict chapel was a small burial ground, enclosed by the remains of a wall. There were perhaps fifty gravestones, most of them leaning over or completely fallen, covered in patches of greenish-yellow lichen and moss, scoured pale by the salt wind and stained by years of driven rain. No names or dates were now decipherable, and the whole place had an air of decay and abandon. Well, perhaps on a warm summer evening it's altogether different, but for now, Mrs. Drablow, it's about as bleak and eerie a place as I can think of. It's time to go inside, I think. Oh! <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to disturb your nest, whatever you are. Is there such a bird as a sea vulture? Yes, you really are enormous and very ugly. I don't... You. How on earth did you... It was the young woman again. The young woman from the funeral. She was standing at the far end of the graveyard, wearing the same black dress and bonnet. She was standing quite motionless, staring directly at me. Good afternoon. I do apologise for surprising you like this. My name is Arthur Kipps. I'm from Bentley Hague, Sweetman and Bentley. Mrs Drablow's solicitors in London. Obviously no one informed you that I would be coming. And still she stared at me, with that expression of... I can only describe it as an expression of desperate, yearning malevolence. It was as if she was searching for something, something which had been taken from her, and towards whoever had taken it, she now directed the purest loathing, hatred, the purest evil, towards me. And yet, I had taken nothing from her. I didn't even know who she was. I had never in my life been so suddenly possessed by fear. As my eyes were held by hers, my knees began to tremble. I could feel my body turning as cold as stone. My heart gave a great lurch, began pounding on my chest like a hammer on an anvil. It was as though I had become paralyzed. Even now, all these years later, I can still feel my flesh begin to creep. I could not bear to stay there, but I had no strength left in my body to turn and run. I was as certain as I had ever been of anything that at any second I would simply fall dead on the ground. And then, quite suddenly, she was gone, slipping silently behind one of the gravestones and away through a gap in the wall. Wait! Come back, please! I just want to know who you are. Perhaps I can help you. What? But that's not possible. Where's she gone? There is nowhere to hide out here. I can see for miles. No! Who is she? Who is she? Oh, I did not believe in ghosts. <laughs> not then. And yet, in the desolation of that burial ground, in that peculiar fading light, I had just seen a woman whose form was in some essential respect ghostly. She had appeared and then vanished in a way that no real living human being could possibly manage to do. But I could have touched her. I saw her quite clearly. She was there. She was real. No. No, I do not believe in ghosts. There's an explanation for this. Somewhere in this old house there is an explanation. Hello? Hello, it's, it's Arthur Kipps again. I didn't mean to startle you just now. All right, Kipps, compose yourself. Now, first know your territory. 
Right. Hallway. Oak staircase leading off. Passage to kitchen and scullery, I presume. Drawing room. Leading through to sitting room. Dining room. All with a rather musty, sweet, sour smell. Though I suppose that's hardly surprising. It must have been shut up for some time now. There was nothing dramatic or unpleasant. The furniture in each room was old-fashioned but good. Solid, dark. Many of the rooms had clearly not been used for years. The whole place was curiously impersonal. The furnishings, the ornaments, the decoration, all dull, gloomy and rather unwelcoming. Here was nothing elegant, nothing that spoke of individuality or taste, nothing to give me the slightest clue as to the identity of the young woman in black I had now seen in two separate graveyards. Small parlour and study. None of it quite to your taste, I'm afraid, Stella. Perhaps we won't move here after all. Now then, what precisely is inside all these cupboards and drawers? Oh! My goodness! It was a cascade of old papers. As I worked my way around the various desks, bureaus and writing tables, I gradually revealed a mountain of correspondence, receipts, legal documents, notebooks, tied up in bundles, yellow with age. Most of it probably worthless, but all of it requiring close examination before I could decide which of it needed to be carried back to London for Mr Bentley's attention. This is a huge task. Did you ever throw away a single piece of paper in your life, Mrs. Drablow? <sighs> oh, there's no point in starting this now. It's far too late. In truth, I was simply too unnerved to consider starting then. The business with the woman in the graveyard had succeeded in unsettling my London composure more than I cared to admit. How Mrs. Drablow had endured day after day, night after night of isolation in that house, and for so many years, I could not conceive. I had been there one afternoon, and already I had had enough of the monotonous greyness, the gloomy melancholy that seemed to be all around, inside and out. I decided a good, brisk walk, though not anywhere near the old burial ground again, would put me in better heart. It would be another hour before Keckwick returned for me, and if I stepped out well, I knew I would either reach Crithin Gifford in time to save him turning out at all, or, at the very least, meet him on the way. Well, at least there's a good supper waiting for me at the Gifford Arms. On the causeway path, it was still quite dry underfoot, although to my left, I saw that the water had begun to seep nearer, quite silent, quite slow. I wondered how deeply the path went under water when the tide was right in. Although on a still night such as this, I knew there was plenty of time to cross in safety, even though the distance was greater on foot than it had seemed when we trotted over in Keckwick's pony cart. Come on, Kipps, step out, step out. Once or twice, I glanced back over my shoulder, half expecting to catch sight of the young woman following me. Perhaps she would catch up with me, explain that the shock of seeing me so unexpectedly in the burial ground had made her shy, but that now she had fully recovered, and please, would I not return with her and join her for a cup of tea whilst we waited for Mr. Keckwick in the warmth? By now, I'd almost persuaded myself there must have been some slope or dip in the ground into which she had concealed herself earlier, before returning to some lonely dwelling tucked down out of sight. After all, I'd not actually searched for her hiding place, but merely glanced around and seen nothing. And the changes of light in such a place can play all manner of tricks. As indeed was being proved to me at that very moment. 
for peering into the greyness ahead, it seemed to me that the end of the causeway was receding from me the further I walked towards it. Very soon, I could not actually see my goal at all. It's a sea fret. The sea fret Mr. Daly told me about. Almost without me realizing, a thick, damp sea mist had rolled over the marshes as I walked and enveloped everything myself, the house behind me, the causeway ahead. This is quite absurd. I can't, <coughs> I can't see anything. <coughs> It was choking, thick and salty, moving in front of my eyes. I felt confused, teased by it, as if it were made up of millions of live fingers that crept over me, hung on me, and then shifted away again. I'd better go back. I'll wait for this to clear. I'm sure Mr. Daly said they lift as quickly as they fall. Oh, God, where's the path? I should have brought a torch. Help! Can anyone hear me? Oh. Please, are you there? Young lady! This is ridiculous. Please, let me reach the house. Can anyone hear me? I need help! Help! Kedwick! Oh, thank God. Keckwick! Mr. Keckwick! Over here! I'm here! Keckwick! Over here! I can't see! No! No! Keckwick! Keckwick! Oh, dear God. Kegwick! No! 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 To this day, I couldn't tell you how I reached the house or how long I lay there in the hallway, weeping in an agony of fear and frustration. I had heard, beyond any doubt, the terrible last sounds of a pony and trap. A pony and trap carrying a child, as well as Keckwick, struggling desperately as it was sucked under by the quicksand. And I'd been able to do nothing, nothing but stand and listen as those poor creatures slowly choked and drowned in the mud and water. I do know that eventually I was able to pull myself together sufficiently to go about the house switching on every light I could make work, hoping against all reason that it would be seen like a light ship by someone somewhere across that dark, misty wasteland. Every room I went to was orderly, dusty, bitterly cold and damp, yet also somehow stifling. As I moved around the house, I grew more rather than less agitated. I began to be angry at Mr. Bentley for sending me here, at my own foolishness in ignoring all the hints and veiled warnings I'd received about the place. And when I came to one door, the only door that was locked, with no keyhole, no bolt on the outside. I'm afraid my anger exploded. <laughs> what? Whoa, whoa. What is it? Oh, yes, wait, wait, oh, yeah, I'm coming. Who is it? Who's, who's out there? 
Mr. Kitts? Ketwick? No! You have to wait for a fret like that to clear itself. Don't cross it over while the fret's up. Unlucky for you, that one. Ketwick? How did you... After that, there's the wait for the tide. Awkward place. You'll be finding that out fast enough. What, uh... What time is it? Two. In the morning? It can't be. I haven't slept that... I, I was trying to attract attention. With the lights. Wouldn't have left you over the night. Wouldn't do that to you. No, no, thank you. I'm most grateful to you. Aye. But what happened to you? How do you manage to be here? How did you get out? Best climb up, Mr Kipps. It wasn't you, was it? Out there on the marsh. It was someone else. Who, Mr Kirkwick? Who in their right mind would have been driving out there on a night like this and with a young child? Who was it? He's wanting to get home, Mr Kipps. Yes. Yes, I am... Um... I must lock up the house before. <coughs> Thank you. Oh, girl, Kiro. I fell into a sort of trance, half sleeping, half waking, rocked by the motion of the cart. I knew that I had entered some hitherto unimagined realm of consciousness, that coming to this place had already changed me, and that there was no going back. I had seen things I'd never dreamed of seeing, and heard things too. I knew then that the woman by the graves had been ghostly, and I began to suspect, as we crossed the now quite clear causeway beneath the riding moon, that the pony and trap I had heard out on the marsh, the pony and trap with the child who had cried out so terribly and which had been sucked into the quicksands, they too had not been real, not their present substantial, but ghostly also. Oh, what I had heard, I had heard. What I had seen, the woman with the pale, wasted face by the grave of Mrs. Drablow and again in the old burial ground, I had seen. I would have sworn an oath to it, and yet they had been, in some sense I did not then understand, unreal, ghostly, things that were dead. Come on now, get up! In episode two of The Woman in Black by Susan Hill, dramatized for radio by John Strickland, Old Kipps was played by John Woodvine, Young Kipps by Robert Glenister, The Landlady by Paula Tilbrook, Mr. Jerome by Stuart Richman, and Keckwick by James Quinn. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Technical presentation was by Peter Bellum, Maggie Richmond, and Steve Brook. The music was specially composed by Derek Pierce. The Woman in Black was directed in Manchester by Chris Wallace.